Thank you all for joining us today for the Alliance to Advance Patient-Centered Cancer Care webinar series. The Merck Foundation established the Alliance in 2016 to improve the quality and delivery of patient-centered care, selecting six program sites that are working to enhance patient-provider communication, cultivating patient engagement, and improving timely access to treatments. The Alliance includes the following organizations, Georgia Cancer Center for Excellence at Grady Health System, the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine, Massachusetts General Hospital Cancer Center, Northwestern University Feinberg School of Medicine, Ohio State University Comprehensive Cancer Center, the University of Arizona Cancer Center, and the University of Michigan School of Nursing, which serves as the National Program Office. To learn more about the Alliance, please visit our website at cancercarealliance.org. So today I have the pleasure of introducing uh, Dr. Michael Kolodje. He is joining us from AdV Health, where he is Vice President and Chief Innovation Officer. Dr. Kloje previously served as Medical Director for Oncology Services for the U.S. Oncology Network, where he helped direct the implementation of its Clinical Pathways Initiative, integration of the USON EMR into this program, and the development of the USON Disease Management and Advanced Care Planning Programs, now known as InEvent Oncology. He then became the National Medical Director of Oncology Solutions at Aetna, where he, he directed Aetna's oncology delivery reform pilots and was the architect of the Aetna Oncology Medical Home Program. He was also previously the National Medical Director of Managed Care Strategy at Flatiron Health, where he applied the core tech and data capabilities of Flatiron to facilitate practice transformation and success in alternative payment models. Dr. Kloje joined ADV Health in 2017. He is a fellow of the American College of Physicians and has published and spoken extensively on payment reform, personalized medicine, and practice care delivery transformation in oncology. So today, Dr. Kloje will be speaking with us about the oncology care model implications for cancer care delivery and payment reform. There will be a question and answer session following the presentation today. So on the sidebar of your screen, you should be able to see a Q&A symbol, which you can use to submit questions to our presenter. Please hold on submitting your questions until the end of the presentation. And again, a th big thank you to Dr. Kloje for joining us today. Thank you for that very kind introduction. Um, thank you all for joining us this afternoon. I'm going to talk about a, a subject that I have been very involved in for quite some time, um, a, a subject that uh, is um, certainly a topic of uh, much uh, discussion these days. And uh, what I'm going to give you is sort of my spin on it, um, why it happened, how it happened, what's going on with it, and where I think it's going to go. Um, so my my in, my real personal involvement began when I was practicing oncology, which I did for a long time, uh, and a, a desire to look at um, mechanisms by which we could both improve um, the quality of care we were delivering and um, make a case for the value of that care. As Trevor said, uh, uh, I'm going to start with my disclosures. I uh, <clears throat> was. Uh, um, paid partially with stock when I worked at Aetna, now CVS stock, and I work for Advi. Advi is a consulting firm, policy and strategy firm that works with a lot of life science companies, but also with physician networks. So I guess I would be, uh, you could say that uh, uh, I am hope hopelessly conflicted um, because uh, many of the people I work with are very interested in this subject. Now, how did we get here? So I think... Um, Everyone on this call is quite well aware of the fact that um, this discussion, this national discussion about healthcare, 
is uh, partially related to the fact that we pay a lot for health care in the United States. We pay a lot uh, as expressed by percentage of the gross domestic product. Certainly, we pay more than any other industrialized nation. Um, now, what does that mean to us? What does that mean to you? Well, it means that more and more of uh, your salary um, is being taken up by uh, expenditures on health care. So this slide, which uh, I call this slide my Lee Newcomer slide. Lee has my, been my friend for many, many years. He was in charge of the um, uh, cancer programs at United for many years. Um, Lee used to show this slide, and he said, I cringed, because I knew it was sort of, it was hyperbole, right? There's never going to come a day where um, your health care premium exceeds your uh, family income. But but the fact of the matter is that uh, it has taken up an increasing percent um, of uh, health care income, uh, of, of your total income. Uh, and in fact, um, this slide is probably a little bit better, uh, because uh, for working age Americans, about two thirds of working age Americans receive um, health care uh, as a benefit of employment. Um, and the relative contribution of the individual worker towards the premium has gone up. But in fact, as this slide shows quite convincingly, the, um, the contribution from the employer has gone up even more. And in fact, this, co this increasing contribution. Uh, of the employer uh, is considered to be a significant contributor to wage stagnation and a threat to America's economy. So that that's why this is a big topic. It's people are paying more money, but it also is uh, healthcare expenditures are having a drag on uh, on wages and having a drag on uh, profitability of of uh, U.S. Um, uh, businesses. It is just absolutely fair to say that it is generally believed that the increasing cost of health care is unsustainable. Now, let's talk more specifically about oncology, because that's what I know the most about. And often, oncology is held up as the poster child uh, for the growth in uh, health care expenditures, uh, not always in a good way. So this slide, which comes from the government, uh, looks at what's going to happen to national health care expenditures for cancer care um, between now and 2020. And uh, as you can see, uh, there's a fairly significant increase, although not uniform all, across all cancer types, in how much money uh, we are projected to spend uh, on cancer care uh, in the US. If we break that down a little bit, uh, this slide, which is from uh, work I did at Aetna, shows uh, that the increase in cost is driven by both uh, medical expenditures, that would be things like hospitalization rates, cost of surgery, but even more so by the cost of cancer drugs. Um, so people look at this and they say, well, you know, um, cancer spend is out of control. Let's look at it a different way. Actually, if we look at the type of cancer patient that costs the system the most. Uh, it's patients getting chemotherapy. So this is from a paper that we published a number of years ago that looked at <clears throat> the difference in cost for patients with the most common tumors, um, separated out by whether or not they were receiving systemic therapy. Um, this is the reason that the oncology care model and most everything else that payers are doing these days in oncology is focusing on patients receiving systemic therapy. Now, are we getting good value for the money? And the answer is most payers don't think we are. And I think uh, if you break it down, there are in fact three major areas that they are concerned that the value is not good. The first and arguably the most important is the increasing cost of chemotherapy. The second, which I think um, is uniformly uh, agreed upon as a problem, is that we don't do a very good job with patients at the end of life. And the third, and I will say third and a distant third, 
is the use of unnecessary hospitalizations and ER visits in patients with malignancy. The payers believe, and when I say payers, I, I mean both governmental payers as well as commercial payers, that these three areas need to be a a attacked if we're going to get a handle on the increasing cost of cancer care. Now, with the passage of the ACA, an important laboratory was uh, funded to allow us to examine alternative ways to pay for care, and that laboratory is called CMMI. And the government, looking at CMS and looking at Medicare spend expenditures and Medicaid expenditures and looking at the trajectory as to when Medicare and Medicaid are going to go broke, basically said, we have to do something. And uh, through CMMI, um, as well as through Congress, um, the government has attempted to approach the issue of how to control care. CMMI, of course, uh, is the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation, and it is the birthplace of the oncology care model. Interestingly, CMMI also controls other uh, areas of experimentation and payment, things like the upcoming Radiation Oncology Reimbursement Bundle, uh, as well as, perhaps, the upcoming uh, IPI slash CAP program that has been proposed by the um, Trump administration. Now, the oncology care model is built on the principles of the oncology medical home. The oncology medical home is not a new idea. The oncology medical home has been around, oh gosh, since the late 1970s. And it's a, uh, it's a really easy to embrace care model both from the physician perspective as well as from the patient perspective. It's easy to like the oncology medical home. So what are the oncology medical home or patient-centered medical home principles? Well, the first thing is that there's a physician who's the captain of the ship, but that care is delivered by a team-based approach. Um, and that team-based approach is attentive to the quality of care that's delivered, and it's attentive to the cost of care that's delivered. This, this team, this care team, with the physician as the captain of the ship, uh, is designed to provide um, coordinated care. Um, it's designed to produce care arrived at through shared decision-making. It's designed to do what every person on this phone thinks that the healthcare system ought to do for them. As I said, it's easy to embrace. Quality and safety are hallmarks of the medical home. There should be enhanced access to care. And the system should reward success. That is, the payers should reward success in the medical home um, care delivery model. Now, there are primary care medical homes all over the place. Uh, in fact, when I was at Aetna, um, we... Uh, we uh, had contracts with many medical homes. Uh, when I was at Aetna, we thought we would try to do it in oncology. But I, I needed to translate this into what I thought uh, an oncology medical home should be. And, and this is my interpretation. And it's just mine. Um, first of all, the care should be evidence-based. Uh, that would be an indirect indicator of quality. That there should be enhanced access. And enhanced access means everything from making sure you answer the phone making sure that you effectively triage patients, making sure that um, somebody uh, is uh, available 24 hours a day, uh, making sure that if a patient needs to be seen the same day they can, shared decision-making, and that includes everything from uh, um, making right decisions about chemotherapy through end-of-life care, coordination of care, uh, quality reporting, and, uh, of course, payment reform. Um, a lot of this stuff, if you take a step back and think about it, is exactly what the what the oncology care model aspired to do. Um, so, so what was so convincing about this model? And the answer is that uh, 
back in the 1990s, early 2000s, uh, my friend John Sprandio in Philadelphia decided he was going to do this. He just decided he was going to do it. Nobody gave him any money to do it. He just did it. And he transformed his practice. He changed the way he did things. And he tried to execute on all those clinical uh, features that I just described to you. And what John showed uh, very convincingly is that um, compared to a national benchmark, which here is cited as uh, the study we did at U.S. Oncology with Milliman, um, compared to that national benchmark, he was able to substantially reduce uh, ER utilization and inpatient utilization, uh, both of which are expensive and, uh, in general, unattractive clinical events. So this is how it really began. Uh, it was a care model that was uh, uh, piloted successfully. It was a care model that was um, uh, something that was uh, very patient-centered. It was a care model that physicians could like. So the oncology care model was launched. Um, the oncology care model is the first specialty alternative payment model that CMMI has um, uh, implemented. Uh, as you probably know, CMMI has done other things. Um, there has been a joint replacement bundle. There has been um, uh, other uh, condition-specific mostly inpatient bundled models, but the OCM was the first enhanced care coordinated payment model, and it was focused on oncology for all the reasons that we've just discussed. When it launched, now two and a half years ago, um, 176 practices were included. They had to uh, volunteer. This is a voluntary model. Um, and the program was opened to commercial payers as well. When I was at Aetna, we uh, decided we would participate because we had already built our oncology medical home model, which was quite consistent with the goals of the OCM. And so we were one of 17 payers that signed up. Most payers and most practices that started are still in the model. We see on this map the distribution of practices. When the program was being developed, it was thought it would likely attract mostly freestanding community-based uh, centers. But in fact, uh, the model, uh, as it's currently being executed, involves approximately one-third hospital-based uh, practitioners. As everybody on this call knows, there are really three pieces here. Uh, number one is the uh, OCM is based on uh, Medicare fee-for-service payment. On top of that, uh, there is a monthly uh, enhanced oncology service uh, payment for patients who are undergoing uh, systemic therapy. This monthly payment is 160 per month for a period of six months with the ability to renew. So basically an extra $1,000 per patient with the idea that this money is going to uh, allow practices to transform and offer services otherwise not available. And then finally, um, there is the opportunity to in, uh, earn a performance-based payment uh, by outperforming a target price. And we're going to come back to that. Now, uh, a couple things about the basic features of the OCM. First of all, the trigger for this uh, uh, monthly payment for inclusion in the program includes uh, receiving either oral or uh, intravenous chemotherapy, and there's a list of drugs that qualify you. All of the uh, uh, record keeping um, basically is done by CMS, and then uh, uh, the performance uh, within the program is done in a, uh, if you will, retrospective fashion. However, the payments for the monthly manage management fee are given concurrently with enrollment in the program. The, the program has been very, very interesting for a number of reasons. First of all, I think... Um, I think there was a little bit of a disconnect between what uh, CMM, I thought, practices did routinely or could do routinely and what they wanted. And this was most uh, exemplified in the first year of the program by challenges associated with uh, reporting of quality measures and then subsequently reporting of clinical 
uh, characteristics of individual beneficiaries to a registry. Now, what I mean by that is this. Uh, I believe that uh, OCM had the best of intentions when they tried to identify uh, quality measures that um, were an important component of the program. Uh, however, um, what they chose from were uh, quality measures that had uh, uh, been utilized uh, uh, primarily in another program, either PQRS or or uh, Commission on Cancer. Uh, these were, uh, of course, uh, vetted quality measures, but uh, I think if you ask most oncologists, uh, they didn't really have much to do with how good a job an oncologist was doing. Um, even more importantly, the way the measures were written uh, made it very challenging for practices to get this information together and report it in a timely fashion. Uh, when this was happening, I was working at Flatiron Health, uh, which is, uh, I think most people on the phone know, is a big data um, oncology, big data company. A big component of their business is they have about um, seven, uh, a significant number of practices that utilize their proprietary electronic medical record. They built an OCM product for their practices that allowed for electronic reporting. And I will tell you, there was an in an in immense amount of time working on that product, um, especially early on in this program. Many practices did this manually uh, and had probably the largest Excel spreadsheets known to man. So one of the big learnings at the beginning was uh, if you're going to require quality reporting, um, you can't burden a practice, um, especially when it wasn't part of their routine workflow. Um, and it wasn't easily accomplished electronically. Interestingly, this list has subsequently been pared down substantially by uh, OCM for one reason or another, and only a handful of quality measures have survived. The second thing that we should focus on here is the performance-based payment. Now, um, I said that every practice for every beneficiary identified as uh, qualifying gets this monthly management fee, which is great. That's an extra $1,000 for each patient you treat. However, and at the beginning, I think it's fair to say that most practices, they just loved it, right? They really liked getting that extra money. Uh, it let them do things that they couldn't do before. But ultimately, the interest turned to the methodology around calculation of performance-based payment. And uh, as opposed to choosing a methodology in which uh, they compared uh, mem uh, patients, beneficiaries uh, in the program with concurrent matched beneficiaries um, that were um, not in the program, that's not what they did. What they decided to do was develop a very complicated uh, projected target price based on Medicare claims, a multivariate logistic regression-based uh, correction model for clinical factors that could be gleaned from claims, and then they put things in like a trend factor allowing for medical cost inflation um, and uh, something called a uh, novel therapy uh, correction factor, which prevented practices from choosing not to use expensive novel therapies. Suffice it to say that uh, I think that this methodology um, it, uh, was daunting to practices initially, very hard to get your hands around. I'm a, I'm a, quali uh, I'm a qualitative guy, not a quantitative guy, and I struggled mightily with trying to understand uh, whether this thing actually made sense. Uh, I think uh, this far along in the program, we can probably say it's probably more right than wrong, uh, but it continues to be uh, very challenging. So for each patient, and this is adjudicated at the individual patient level, for each patient giving a particular therapy with a specific disease, there is a target price. For all the patients for a practice within a given performance period, the target prices um, are compared to the actual expenditures, and then um, you find out whether or not you did better than how they, what they thought you were going to do or not. And then it's corrected for uh, a discount, because uh, Medicare has to spend some money to execute this program, and, um, and a performance multiplier. Uh, those quality factors actually weigh into how much uh, your performance-based payment is, and, and you literally could get a check. Now, the performance-based periods are in the past, and the reason for that is because when you're dealing with claims, you have to allow for a period of time for claims to 
kind of roll in. And as those of you who work in hospitals know, hospitals are not necessarily the most efficient um, uh, billers. Um, so you have to wait a little while. So uh, the program has been going on for, uh, oh, two and a half years, almost three years, and we've only had three performance periods. The most recent are reported in February. So we're going to get another performance period reported this summer. And what have we learned? So this is how the program is doing so far. In the first reconciliation period, practices were really pretty unhappy. Um, now, they weren't happy primarily, I think, because there were there were some mistakes made regarding um, the CMS attribution model. And, and I won't go into details here. Some of those mistakes were just dumb, dumb omissions, right? Um, they fixed a lot of those dumb omissions. Um, but even so, the attribution model uh, was complicated uh, when practices um, build the meals and that patient wasn't attributed to them. They had to pay the money back. That caused some pretty hard feelings. Um, that aside, um, uh, there were two other important uh, uh, conclusions from period one. One was that not very many patient uh, practices earn savings, uh, only about 20%. And honestly, they had no idea why they earned savings. The second thing was the data showed that the amount of money spent on systemic therapy was substantially greater than people thought. And that was, that was mind-boggling. The second reconciliation period, a lot of the uh, attribution stuff was fixed. Um, uh, during this period of time, uh, a couple of the uh, predict disease-specific predict models were identified as being imperfect and were fixed. And then um, a, a slightly higher percent of practices earned savings. And then now in the third uh, reconciliation period, a, a slightly higher yet percent of practices have uh, earned the savings. More importantly, over the period of these three uh, reconciliation periods, even practices that had not earned savings have gotten better. Now, um, our fourth period is coming up in, uh, in August. Um, that's important because in October, practices will have to decide whether or not they want to take downside risk. So to this point, uh, if you generate savings, you get a check. If you don't generate savings, you don't have to pay money back. But starting in October, uh, that's going to change. Uh, and what's going to change is this. The practices that are not succeeding in the model will have to, uh, if you will, put your money where your mouth is and decide whether or not you're going to um, be willing to pay money back. And there's a lot of discussion about what's going to happen there. Now, one thing that we've clearly learned is that the claims data is incredible. It helps practices in so many different ways. Um, this is something that practices have never really seen before. It is certainly true that these claims data files are humongous, uh, and uh, uh, practices often have to get help to use them. But honestly, this is stuff practices never knew before. Uh, who's getting hospitalized, and how often, and and maybe why, or what kind of decisions could have been done differently. This has really been a boon to uh, practices that were forward-thinking and really interested in changing the way they deliver care. As I said a minute ago, one thing that has absolutely been striking is how much of care is dependent on uh, the cost of chemotherapy. So <clears throat> I've told you that maybe a third of practices uh, are, are, are succeeding in this model. And uh, and you got to ask yourself, does this make sense? Is is this the way it's supposed to be? And in order to answer that question, I'm gonna I'm gonna take you back to um, another experiment, uh, very similar to this, that maybe can help us right size um, the opportunity. So uh, many of you on this call know about Come Home. Come Home was Dr. Barb McEnany's uh, CMA. CMMI funded oncology medical home uh, pilot. Before the OCM, uh, CMMI was a granting agency, and uh, CMMI gave Barb, I think, $19 million to experiment with six other practices in an oncology medical home type program. And and the uh, the demographics of the patients that were enrolled, which were all Medicare fee for service beneficiaries, are, are shown on the slide. What Come Home did was three things. 
One is they established a standardized triage pathway methodology. Um, so when a patient called with a certain symptom complex related to toxicity of treatment, they were managed in a standardized fashion. The second thing it did was it standardized enhanced access, both through same-day visits as well as uh, extended office hours. Uh, and the third thing they did, and but they really just sort of flirted with it, was establishment of treatment pathways. Now, the Come Home model was built quite differently than the OCM. The Come Home model, uh, in fact, did use a concurrent control group and uh, utilize a methodology called difference and differences. Many of you on this phone call know what difference and differences is. Difference and differences is to detect um, impact of the program on trends. So they look at the cost in a uh, propensity match control group uh, as well as the cost in, uh, in the patients in Barb's practice, and then they uh, – um, look at a before and after. So that if, for example, the control group uh, has a decrease in cost, Barb's intervention group would have to have a greater decrease in cost in order to um, interpret that the, pro the program was successful. Now, uh, until recently, we didn't actually know what the results of this. Uh, there was a way you could figure out what the results were. In fact, because it's a granting agency every year, there was a report generated that uh, lets you see how they were doing, and this slide is taken from that report. Um, after three years, um, uh, this is how well the program did. Um, now, uh, you are either an optimist or a pessimist. I call myself a realist. And, and what, this, what the program showed was that this approach uh, of six, seven very carefully selected practices implementing an aggressive program yielded essentially no impact on the hospitalization rate a small impact on the ER rate, a small impact on readmissions, and a modest reduction in total cost of care. Um, subsequent to this report, Barb uh, uh, and her colleagues have published in the Journal of Oncology Practice just a couple months ago a subset analysis of, of some of the patients that suggested that there was a slightly more robust uh, savings generated, although um, the savings generated from were from basically the same uh, categories that we see here. Now, uh, uh, if you do the math uh, for an average Medicare patient, this number uh, turns out to be somewhat less than four uh, percent of the total cost of care. Barb's number was closer to six to eight percent of the total cost of care. But no matter how you slice it, uh, that's a fairly modest uh, reduction in the cost of care. Uh, at the expense in this program of $19 million to transform practices. So a lot of people looked at this and said, well, you know, you just got to wait a little longer because, you know, you're transforming culture and it takes a while. But I, I will show you that, in fact, that if you look at the ER and hospitalization rates, there's no indication that there's a learning curve here. In fact, um, these numbers look pretty flat to me. So I think uh, my conclusion from this is that based on the data that we've shown you so far, reducing ER and inpatient doesn't really have that huge an impact. And the reason for that, I think, is because we don't admit all that many people in oncology anymore. Anybody who rounds uh, specifically on the weekends knows that. So the OCM is interesting because um, it is a part of a CMMI portfolio. It's a voluntary program. It had its growing pains from an administrative perspective and from understanding the PBP. But practices have learned a lot. They've learned a lot about how to deliver care, and patients have gotten better care. It's really good. Now, I think there's, there's a, a big question about what's going to happen this summer, um, uh, how many practices are going to take risk. I, I, I anticipate enough practices will take risk for the program to continue. That's what I anticipate. Now, we have learned a couple of things that appear to work. Um, these learnings are not necessarily directly from the OCM, but they happen concurrently with the OCM. The first is that better end-of-life care makes a big difference. The second is that navigation can really help. And the third is that if you pay attention to cost of drugs, you can do pretty well. So uh, interestingly, um, there was a paper published in Health Affairs that looked at um, the CMMI experiments, of which Barb's uh, program was one, in alternative payment models in oncology. And, and this specific uh, study looked at end-of-life spending. 
And I draw your attention to the uh, far left of each of these three panels, which show that compared uh, uh, to the uh, comparison group, the, practice, the patients treated within the um, come home model had substantially lower end of life costs, uh, utilization of clinical services, and had better uh, hospice enrollment. Now, this is really curious because the program did not have a specific end of life module, if you will. They did not standardize end of life care. But what they did was they answered the phone. And in patients who ha are, are hospitalized at end of life, it's not usually related to um, costs, uh, toxicity related to chemotherapy. It's usually because they have an uncontrolled symptom of advanced malignancy. And to the extent that those symptoms were actively and uh, effectively managed by seeing the patient in the office the same day, it really worked. So this is an important take home message. Second take home message, navigation is a good thing. Now when, when the OCM was built, navigation was a core principle. And navigation is a good thing because the healthcare system is really, really complicated. And this was, um, this was shown quite beautifully by uh, Dr. Rock at University of Alabama, Alabama, Birmingham, who published this study looking at the cost of care both before and after institution of a navigation program at the University of Alabama Birmingham. This navigation program was not exclusively to patients receiving systemic therapy. It was for all cancer patients, and it was not just at the mothership. It was at all the hospitals that they worked at. And she showed that uh, compared to a matched control group, there was a substantial reduction in total cost of care, total reduction, uh, substantial reduction in hospitalization rate, and ER utilization. Now, you can say that uh, if you look at these graphs, it's pretty clear that they were crummy when they started. And I don't think you can argue with that statement. But they got better fast. And it made a huge difference. And I think all of us on this call can agree that patients benefit from navigator function. They benefit from having their answers, uh, their questions answered. And they benefit from being steered in the right direction. And then the final thing uh, that we learned, uh, and this is from work that I did when I was at Aetna in collaboration with Texas Oncology, is that if you add a path, clinical pathways program to uh, a medical home care delivery model, you can really increase the savings you generate. So Texas Oncology was doing uh, a very comparable oncology medical home model to the OCM, but in addition, they utilize pathways. And over a three-year period, we saw that there was some reduction in both inpatient and ER utilization, but the savings were largely generated by the pathways program. Again, this is uh, compared to a uh, geographically matched uh, cohort of patients. You can see that the savings percent on the bottom for the total cost of care was 18%. Uh, as opposed to the savings that were generated in the Come Home project, which were somewhere between, well, 4 and 8%. What's the take home here? Drugs matter. Drugs matter a lot. And in fact, I think what we've seen in the OCM to this point is that practices that have started to tackle drugs are actually doing quite well in the model, but the OCM was not built principally to tackle the cost of chemotherapy. So what are we going to do about that? What does the next model need to do? So I, I want to remind you that dealing with the cost of drugs is not a simple matter. Um, we are blessed with innovation. Unfortunately, we are cursed with the fact that the cost of drugs has gone up really insanely. That's shown on the left-hand side of this uh, graph from work done by Peter Bach at Sloan Kettering. Uh, this slide is interesting not because the curve is going up. The slide is interesting because it's a logarithmic scale. So the cost is going up. And then on the right side, Dr. Prasad, who was at North Carolina at the time, showed that the amount uh, of uh, premium for new drugs, uh, when uh, an attempt was made to correlate that with the endpoint, that led to regulatory approval. The the amount increase had absolutely no relationship to the amount of added benefit at the time of the regulatory trial. So one would hope that if it was really better, 
that uh, the the increase in cost would be commensurate, but that's not really what the study showed. The study showed there was no relationship between the cost at a market entry and the uh, and the amount of benefit. Now, why is this important? Because, and this is data from Brookings, <clears throat> the drug costs are going up. And we talk a lot about patient out-of-pocket, which is certainly important. But the percentage of that pay comes from, uh, of that amount of money, the, the percentage is increasing at the expense of the payers. And that's why everybody's interested in this. Payers really have had very little they could do about it. Oncology is kind of unique, right? It's uh, been radioactive for a long time. Um, there are both federal laws as well as state mandates that require coverage for chemotherapy drugs. Um, things like NICE in the UK simply do not exist in this country, and there's no such thing as not covering an oncology drug. So payers have had limited options. So when I say that Chemotherapy makes up a big part of the cost of care for an OCM beneficiary. Uh, this is what I mean. And this is actually from the baseline period. So if you add together Part B and Part D drugs, at the beginning before the program started, it looked like that made up, oh, 40, 45% of the total cost of care. In the most recent performance period, chemotherapy drugs make up close to 60% of the total cost of care. So it's it's obvious that it needs attention. And in some diseases, it needs attention more than in other diseases. So there's some heterogeneity, as shown on this slide, in terms of where the diseases are, where the cost of drugs is high. Now, back when I was at U.S. Oncology, and this work was done literally 12 years ago, we thought that we could uh, potentially look at value-based prescribing behavior. And we looked at non-small cell lung cancer. So the reason we looked at non-small cell lung cancer is frankly nothing worked. And uh, there were a lot of treatment options that were equally ineffective. And there was a st substantial difference in the cost associated with those treatment options. And what we did was we said, okay, we, we're going to uh, tell our, our doctors that these, this is the treatment that we recommend on a value-based basis. That there are clinical reasons to use other treatment choices, but all other things being equal, if you could use the value-based choice, you should use it. And we showed that um, quite convincingly that if you if you followed the pathway, you could save about a third, and the outcome was exactly the same. And this paper, which was published in 2008, still gets widely cited as the evidence that clinical pathways um, can generate savings. Pathways are very simple. They involve a structured analysis of all appropriate choices, a close look at efficacy, a close look at toxicity, and finally, a look at cost. If a therapy is highly efficacious and clearly best in class, it is always on pathway. HER2-based therapies are always on pathway. IO therapies are always on pathway for lung cancer. But there are still plenty of options. And the pathways programs all offer the opportunity to use basic clinical inputs to provide treatment options and then to collate results and track physician performance. Now, this is not a new idea, like I said. It's been around 10 years. And it's had its ups and downs. Um, a few years ago, uh, WellPoint, Anthem WellPoint, decided they would literally implement a national pathways program. Their program was such that um, they told physicians what the pathway choices were. And to the extent that physicians chose pathway choices, um, that would generate savings. And some of those savings would be given back to the provider in a management fee. Anthem has now implemented this program in all 14 of its states, in all disease states, Exactly how much savings have been generated are not completely clear, but they have continued with the program. More recently, United, in collaboration with Evacor and NCCN, have done a similar thing. What United did was they had Evacor put NCCN guidelines, not compendia, NCCN guidelines, which are sensitive 
to both the combination agents as well as to line of therapy into a portal. And they implemented it initially in the state of Florida and then subsequently nationally. And what this United Evercore pilot showed was that mandatory use of the NCCN guidelines could generate significant savings. In fact, they showed 20% savings compared to trend, which is quite substantial. So payers are liking pathways. They like pathways. They think pathways may well be a relatively straightforward solution to controlling the cost of care. But I don't think we're done there. I think there's a lot of belief that physicians, oncologists, prescribe more expensive drugs to make more money. Now, I've been fighting that perspective for 20 years now, and I don't anticipate that that sentiment is going to change anytime soon. So for community oncology uh, practices, and in fact for hospital-based practices, there's a significant amount of uh, profit or income that is generated by the markup associated with chemotherapy because the uh, methodology by which chemotherapy is administered and then billed is uh, via something called the buy and bill model. Recently, the federal government has become enamored with the idea of a program where buy and bill is literally eliminated and replaced by a set management fee. The idea here is that by eliminating the physician inducement to prescribe more expensive therapies, there will be further reduction in the cost of care. Now, I'm, I'm not going to go into detail about what the problems with CAP are, including the fact that the government tried to do this about 10 years ago and it failed completely. But, but let's just say, for the sake of today's discussion, that re eliminating that inducement to prescribe is a hot topic. The government, the Trump White House, Dr. Azar, uh, Alex Azar, and the folks at HHS, believe very, very strongly in a model that eliminates a cost plus reimbursement model. And interestingly, there has been precedent. So some of you may be aware of the United Healthcare episode of Care Model that was published several years ago. Uh, what Lee Newcomer did was he, he took a handful of practices and he basically said, you know, let's pick out common diseases. Uh, you guys tell me what chemotherapy you want. We'll fix the margin. I'll just pay you that as a management fee. You won't, you won't do buy and bill and then you'll pay attention to how you care for the patient. And this was how the results were presented. The results of the model showed that the total cost of care was 34% lower in the involved practices, although the cost of drugs went up. Now, this publication, um, in my opinion, is problematic for, for a number of different reasons, but I don't wanna get into that. What I wanna get into is this. Those six practices, they agreed to do it. They agreed to accept a management fee in lieu of buy and bill. These are not little tiny baby practices. These are six of the best practices in America. So now we got a little bit of back to the future. So Barb McEnany uh, has uh, recently submitted uh, to PTAC uh, an alternative payment model proposal called Mason. And uh, this is a potential successor to OCM. Uh, in Barb's model, which I think is very interesting, there is a basically a bundled reimbursement for all non-drug-related services. And the drugs are paid to the practice at acquisition price with a small handling fee and with a management fee added to the bundle payment, uh, thereby, for all intents and purposes, eliminating buy and bill. Now, CAP, the United Episode, and Mason all look at ways to control drug costs, at least in part, by fixing a margin or a management fee and eliminating physician uh, uh reimbursement in a cost plus model. And I think that although all three of these uh, uh, have a way to go, I think we should keep our eyes very closely on how this model uh, goes forward. PTAC did recommend this model going forward, 
only problem is that not a single PTAC model has ever been implemented by HHS. So we'll see what happens. So the OCM's transitional and future models will need to address cost of drugs. Um, pathways may be the least intrusive approach, but eliminating financial incentives are on every ra payer's radar screen. So the conclusions, and then we've got about 10 minutes for questions, are the cost of healthcare is rising at an unsustainable rate. The OCM is a really important experiment. It has dramatically changed and improved cancer care, no question. But it's really not an APM that will significantly alter the cost trajectory, in my opinion, and probably is not scalable. We've learned about how helpful claims data is. We've also learned that we need to address the cost of drugs directly, and pathways are one way to do it. And with that, I will stop, and we have about 10 minutes for questions, and I thank everybody for their attention. Excellent. Thank you, Dr. Kaloje, for that presentation. Um, I want to remind our attendees to, uh, if you have questions for Dr. Kaloje, to submit them in the Q&A section, which is on the right side of your screen. Um, and also, I want to bring your attention to um, a quick link that I'll be posting in the chat section of this webinar that will include a link to an evaluation survey so that you can provide feedback on the webinar. Um, that is really helpful for us uh, in terms of programming for future webinars. So thank you for that. Um, uh, we'll wait a little bit to let uh, questions roll in um, from our attendees. However, we did have some questions, Dr. Cloje, uh, prior to the presentation. And um, probably have a time for a few of these here. And the first one is, uh, are there lessons learned from national healthcare systems, such as NHS or Canada's Medicare, that could be applied to this model? Uh, so the answer is that, as far as I know, there are no disease-specific uh, um, uh, systems in Canada. I think the one approach uh, that has has been, uh, you know, adopted by much of the world is some sort of uh, a way to set drug prices, and that uh, usually is uh, through uh, health technology assessment, which people have felt has been uh, uh, basically uh, uh, politically. Uh, impossible in the U.S. So I, I think uh, the interesting part of the IPI as proposed by the par uh, Trump administration is that it in fact does use, um, it rides on the coattails of international, international health technology assessment. So we'll see where that goes. But that is one approach. And that is basically reference pricing, right? So um, uh, by deciding what a fair price is, a value-driven price, you can reduce the cost because you reduce the amount you're willing to pay. Okay, so we have another question here uh, coming in. Uh, this is a two-parter. Uh, the first was, uh, do we have a sense of what kinds of practices had better performance outcomes in the OCM? That's the first part. And then the second part is, do you think moving forward, there are ways to combine something like Pathways with some of the other care delivery innovations? So the answer to the first question is, no, and that's the most maddening part of the whole exercise as far as I'm concerned. So there really hasn't been a lot of benchmarking, a lot of dialogue between practices. I think, you know, CMM might try to set up chat rooms, but I'm not sure that really went anywhere. There are about three or four analytics vendors out there working with individual practices. They might be benchmarking within their group of practices, but not outside. So no, we it's really frustrating that we haven't learned more that way. That's one. Number two is... Yes, I, I think uh, some amalgamation of um, uh, a, a care model uh, that looks kind of like the OCM minus the cost of drugs along with some sort of pathways type program uh, concurrent with the uh, uh, a, a management model probably will be uh, an attractive uh, uh, next step in our evolution of how we look at these uh, care delivery systems. Okay, so another question here that we received um, specifically has to do with patient navigation. And of course, you spent a little bit of time talking about the benefits of patient navigation. Um, this question says, um, does the OCM offer any insights 
on how best to finance patient navigation in cancer care more globally? So, of course, within the OCM, that's the reason you get the MEOS. The uh, uh, CMMI doesn't tell you how to spend the money. Um, they just uh, tell you you have to do navigation care. Now, it's interesting because, um, you know, the, the history of navigation is very, very interesting to me because, of course, it started in Harlem with a surgeon, uh, and it was what it was then and what it is now. I think it's changed a lot. And I, I think that question of whether or not you need a nurse or whether lay navigation is good enough, what training that person needs, what they're empowered to do, how they respond to the rest of the team, are all unanswered questions. It's kind of like palliative care. It's really easy to embrace palliative care. I just want you to define it for me. And navigation is kind of the same way. Um, if you talk to Dr. Rock, there really wasn't a formula that they utilized at UAB. But in fact, in the absence of any services, th this model that they put forth had an incredible effect. And, and I think it's a great place to start. So the, the answer is the money is supposed to come from the meals. And I think there's a general agreement that as we look at the next um, uh, <clears throat> payment model, there will have to be some sort of, of um, added reimbursement for enhanced clinical services. I think that's absolutely true. All right. Well, we're coming up on the end of the hour here, so I think that might be a great place to end the presentation. Um, Dr. Cloje, I, I really want to say thank you very much for spending your time with us and offering this wonderful presentation, um, and to our attendees who joined us today. Um, we're really happy you could be with us. Uh, so the video from today's presentation will be available on our, um, our website, cancercarealliance.org, that will pop up in the next few weeks. Um, again, uh, I posted a link to our evaluation survey for the webinar today in the chat section. However, our attendees will also receive a follow-up email shortly to evaluate today's webinar. Um, we really appreciate your feedback. And again, thank you, thank you uh, to Dr. Koloje. Totally my pleasure. Thanks a lot.